is Edwin, the Magic Engineer again, and I'm back to discuss uh, just interest rates in general. Um, the last finance video I did was basically talking about like the whole Jones family thing and was talking about how money moves around in government and relating it to personal finances. And uh, that video I posted on my own channel, it didn't uh, do fantastic because most people that come to my channel want games. Then uh, Gregory Manorino, actually I was talk chatting with him and he actually agreed to post it on his channel. And a lot of people seemed to like that and they were requesting some other videos. And so this is some of the topics that they were asking for. So I figured I would just make this, post it on my channel. And if Gregory Manorino wants it or not, then up to him. But either way, it's here and it's available. So I hope this is helpful to you guys. So what I wanna talk about is interest rates. And I know this looks kind of complicated, what I've got right up here on the board, but I'll try to break down what I've got here for you to make it a little bit more straightforward. I didn't want to spend a lot of time drawing this in the video, so I drew it beforehand. So the red that you see here are all different entities that actually exist, uh, like you know, groups, buildings, people in them, stuff like that. The black things are things that can all actually be invested in. And the green is all basically the transactions of, of money flowing back and forth between different groups, right? So um, like for things you can invest in, like you know, banks, uh, they sell mortgages and the stock market exists and mainly investors are working with that. The US Treasury deals with bonds. And in the last video that I, I'll link right up here, um, I actually talked about the treasury bonds and how the government has to sell treasury bonds. And that's kind of something to keep in mind when you're watching this video. So the first thing I wanted to break down, and you kind of have to show all this to make it clear, is um, Janet Yellen is the Fed chair, and what she's constantly doing meetings about is raising the interest rates. And uh, the thing that I wanted to make clear is what is that interest rate that Janet keeps talking about? Well, that's an interest rate called the federal funds rate, and I'm showing it right here, federal funds rate. And what happens is when the Fed raises that federal funds rate, when the Federal Reserve makes a loan to a bank, they make it at that federal funds rate. And so the banks, they are, they are affected by that federal funds rate. Just in the same way like an investor, when you buy a house, you are going to be affected by the interest rate on your mortgage. And... Um, the bonds are affected by interest rates. If an investor buys a bond, it's in, he's affected by the interest rate. The banks are affected by the interest rate at the federal funds rate. So um, there's a couple things that are fairly hard ties, like market-wise, that determine why that federal funds rate is like so important. Um, one of them is banks have a couple different main types of loans they can make. And of course, it, all of this is more complicated than what I'm showing here. I'm trying to boil it down and make it simple, so it remains interesting. So banks can basically, um, they can have mortgages, and generally speaking, if you have like a 30-year mortgage at a bank, you can basically look at the price of a 10-year bond, which is sold by the treasury. They sell, these ones are bonds, these are notes, and I think these are bills, and bills are the shortest term. Notes are like one to nine years, and the bonds are 10 years to like 30-year bonds. So a bank looks at this one, the 10 year bond price, they add 2% and that's about what you get for home mortgages. In fact, they're so correlated. If you look at the 10 year bond rate and bank rates on like a graph, they, they do this is what they effectively do. Like when one of them like goes up, the other one goes down, they stay very correlated. So they're very fixed so much to where you can basically just say the 30 year mortgage rate is basically the 10 year bond rate plus 2%. Now the prime rate loans, that's like short-term loans. Like if you're gonna get like either credit card or like, I, th I think that counts for like cars and stuff like that. For shorter term loans, that's called the prime rate loans. And that's generally not fixed on bonds, that's fixed on the federal funds rate. And basically banks take the federal funds rate and they add 3% to it, right? So now that you see that, here's, here's the big question. How does the Fed raising rates affect stocks? How does it affect home loans? How does it affect um, prime rate loans? How does it affect bonds? That's what I'll walk through now that I've got this basically laid out. When the Fed raises their federal funds rate, that will directly change the prime rate loans because that's just federal funds rate plus 3%, right? Now, um, 
the way it's going to change the actual mortgages is because banks, if banks ever get into trouble, they need to borrow money from the Fed. That's where they can actually get a new injection of liquidity to basically make them solvent again if they need to. So banks are very focused on this, right? They don't want the mortgage price to get too far away from this. It has to stay fairly close. It has to kind of keep an eye on it and watch it, right? But the banks are also competing with each other, right? So they've got forces pushing on them both ways, right? So what happens is when the Treasury, the United States, they remember they have to sell bonds because there's always a deficit. The government always spends too much money. When the Treasury decides that they need to sell bonds and they put those bonds out to the market, a bunch of banks, they all bid on what those bonds are. And also at times investors will bid because everybody is buying and selling. And eventually the market for bonds will land on an interest rate. And then those bonds will be bought, bought at that interest rate. So if the federal funds rate goes up, the banks, it's kind of like their access to money changes and they need to be more aware of what they're actually bidding for these bond rates. So there's a time, the federal funds rate is directly tied to the prime rate loans. The bonds get, get um, affected by banks who have all, basically all the money that are basically buying up bonds when they need to and bidding on them to push them back out into the market and make a profit and stuff. And so that federal funds rate affects that. But then since mortgages are based on the 10 year bond, so basically everything here is all affected by the federal funds rate. Now, here's the big break that Janet Yellen and the others at the Fed try to pretend like doesn't exist. You notice that over here in, in stocks, there's no direct connection to the Federal Reserve, right? Which is, side note, slightly different in Japan. In Japan, their, their bank, the Bank of Japan, actually can buy stocks and at this second, the Bank of Japan owns like two thirds of the stocks in their stock market, which is crazy. But anyways, our Fed, the US Fed can't directly buy stocks. And so they say, well, when the federal funds rate goes up or down, stock market going up or down is just basically investor greed is what they try to like claim or fear, right? They don't try to claim any responsibility, but that's not really quite true. Because what basically happens is the thing that ties this to this it's not a direct link, it's these guys, it's the investors. Because investors are sitting right here, that, that's me and that's companies, right? Investors can buy and sell stocks, they can buy and sell mortgages, they can buy and sell treasury bonds, and they don't have to pay taxes, yes, but an investor can basically say, do I wanna buy stocks? Do I wanna buy bonds? Do I want to buy real estate? And if one of these goes up versus another, money will flow from one to another, right? And through investors, stocks definitely have a tie to all of these markets because these guys, us, we're the ones that will basically tie those together. And so not only that, but if the Fed does like what they did in like 2000 as a result to the dot-com crash, if the Fed drops the rates for the federal funds rate way down, and then mortgages drop way down and bonds drop way down, well, investors now have access to money through borrowing at banks, that's like really cheap. I mean, you can borrow money for almost nothing. And so if you can borrow money at near 0% and you can go invest it and make a bunch of money and then that money comes back into the market, what happens basically is all this money gets, when the rates drop here, it makes access to money very easily. More money gets created here in the system through fractional reserve lending. And when all that money supply multiplies up, it eventually makes its way everywhere. It makes its way into stocks. It makes its way into mortgages. It, it basically creates a bond bubble. All this money flowing around just creates this effect. So there is an effect through investors, through like market prices. And there's also an effect that happens just based on the rates being really low. Now there's something else I want to mention. Um, normally banks are not allowed to buy stocks, but there was a time a long time ago where they basically could. And what happened was in uh, 1929, I think, you know, the market started having problems. This is right before Great Depression. And um, there was an act put in, I think it was called Glass-Steagall and uh, something like this. And Glass-Steagall was put in, which basically said, you know, this is a pretty bad idea for banks to directly be able to invest in the stock market. We don't really like this. It's gonna cause market issues. So we severed that link, right? 
And then what happened in, I think, 1999, um, after uh, dot-com, uh, let's see, the banks, no, sorry, right before dot-com, the banks were allowed to actually uh, do a little bit of investing in the stock market again. So what that basically meant is banks could now take invest, you know, depositors' money and go gamble it in the stock market, right? Well, that, of course, created a big issue that was part of what caused the 2008 crash, and that was not a really good thing. So in 2010, they instituted uh, Dodd-Frank. And when they instituted that, what they basically did is there's like eight things that they did, but one of them was they, they severed this again. But that would take a few years to go into effect where banks couldn't really buy stocks anymore. So that, that's an interesting thing. It's kind of like a little gap of time where, where we basically allowed banks to get into stocks. Then we had to remember like, oh, that was a bad idea. We really shouldn't have done that. There's another thing that we did over here, and I talked about it in my last uh, video. The Fed has done the quantitative easing program. And that's basically where the Fed, for a short amount of time, was allowed to buy uh, treasuries. And if money was flowing this way, then that means the Fed was putting money into the Treasury. So this was the QE program. And then the thing that everyone's worried about right now is because now the, the, um, the Fed basically has all these bonds built up and they need to sell it back kind of like into the market and compete with everybody. And if the Fed sells that back in, that's called the unwind, right? So the process go another way is the unwind. So um, that's not even normally supposed to be there because the Fed normally isn't really dealing in treasuries directly. They only did that because the rest of the market wasn't really buying bonds. But anyways, um, I wanted to show that and hopefully that gives people a good visual on how the stock market actually works. Um, sorry, not stock market, the uh, interest rates actually work. So um, there's a couple other topics I want to talk about. I'm going to check my time on the camera, see how I'm doing. And if I still have time, then I'm going to touch on three other topics. Okay, I think I might have time. So I'm going to try to like go through these next three topics. So I just talked about interest rates and the effect on the whole system. What I want to talk about now is when interest rates go up, what's the effect going to be on housing, bonds, and uh, possibly the yield curve? Maybe just an explanation of what that is. So um, quick, first I want to talk about housing and uh, the example I like to use that I usually tell friends about. Imagine you're going to buy a house and it's a $500,000 house, right? And let's say you're going to put 20% down, right? So uh, minus the 20%, what you're basically going to have is $400,000 that you're going to borrow, right? Now let's say you borrow it at, you know, today's emergency low interest rate. So you're borrowing at uh, 3% is the loan that you're going to take on this $500,000 house. Remember, this is the principal value, and this is what your loan's going to be because you had 100 grand cash that you put down on the house now, right? So then um, if you do the math on what this works out to be in a monthly payment, I'll just tell you it works out to be about $16.86. Yeah, $16.86 per month. Now, I'm going to make one assumption here that hopefully – makes sense that when I tell you this next part, it's, it's all based on this one assumption. The basic assumption is that this is what people these days really honestly care about when they buy a car, when they go to school and take a loan for education, or when they buy a house, they look at the monthly payment and they look at what their income is and they look at the monthly payment. And these days, I mean, house prices can be crazy prices, but your friends and family will say, oh, but don't worry about it. If you can afford the monthly, then you can afford it. So. This is what people actually care about, right? Now, let's take just this interest rate changing. Let's say this turns from 3% into what's a normal historical interest rate. You now, people don't even understand sometimes these days, this is super low. The 100 year normal interest rate is between like seven or 8% for your home loan, right? So let's take this and go to 8%. So interest rates change, it turns into 8%. And so what we're going to shoot for is still a monthly payment somewhere about here. So the question is, well, what is the home's value going to be? Well, you have to work backwards a little bit. So um, let's see, I've already done the math. I'm looking at my notes over here on the side. So if your house basically turns into $287,500, then that will work out to 230 grand of loan. 
and uh, then like a 57.5, oops, 5%, uh, no, sorry, 57.5K uh, down payment, right? So this will be the new principal price of the home. And the reason why this calculation matters is because a home that's worth this much at that interest rate is going to cost, uh, let's see, I have it written down over there, 1687, I think it's 1687, so almost the same price, right? So the big takeaway is the $500,000 house is basically going to go down to $287,000 because even though you feel like you're okay, like, cause you know, you bought your home and you're making your monthly payment and you're at a fixed interest rate. So you're paying that every month. The problem is your neighbor and all your neighbors around you because their houses are likely pretty close in price to your house. And you have a loan of 500,000, oh, sorry, 400,000 on a $500,000 house. So here you have a hundred grand of equity, right? Well, when your neighbor and his neighbor and everyone else sells their houses and the prices go down, you're still making this payment. You still owe $400,000, but now your house is only worth $287,000. That hundred grand of equity that you put in, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. It's gone because the bank doesn't say we're going to give up our portion. No, no, no. You give up your portion. So your equity is totally gone. You owe $400,000 on a house that's only worth $287,000. You're stuck and you can't sell, right? That's what happens when interest rates go up on a home because it all comes down to the monthly payment. That's what people will look at. So that's homes. We did that one. So now let's go through bonds. So um, for the bonds, Bonds are weird because it's kind of like an inverse thing, you know, a bond bubble breaking is just awkward and people don't think about it because it's kind of reversed. So let's take an example where you're going to buy a 10 year bond and let's say you're going to put in $10,000 into it, right? That's the example I want to use to describe this. So, um, and let's say that bond was paying like 1%. And that's kind of like, there's a lot of bonds out there that are paying real low, but they're not exactly this, but they're close. And this makes the math fairly easy. So I'm just going to go with this. So this bond, it's going to pay 1% every year, which is basically a um, hundred dollars. So it's $500 every six months, right? So at the end of that amount of time of that 10 year period, what you're basically going to have is $11,000. So you got back your original 10 plus like 1,000. So basically one K of profit is, is what your actual profit actually was, right? But that was 1%. So now um, let's take an example. Let's say you went out and you bought this 10 year bond at $10,000 at 1%. And then like the next day, the Fed raised rates, right? And let's say that bond went from 1% up to 5%. And, if, and this kind of fits the last example, because if it homes are like at 8%, a 10 year bond is probably going to be somewhere around like 5%, right? So the next day after you bought this one, the newer bonds are now being sold. So it's still $10,000 in 10 year, but now it's at 5%, right? So um, that bond at the end of that amount of time is basically going to make $15,000 because it's going to be making so much more money like every six month period, right? So the profit on this guy is 5,000, but more importantly, the profit was, you know, 5%, right? So the thing is, if you bought this bond and you put this much money and it's only going to make this, and then the interest rates go up, well, nobody's going to pay you $10,000 to buy your bond. If you wanted, because you're only making 1%. Now you want to get rid of that bond, right? but no one wants to buy it at $10,000. They're going to pay you much less. And the, what they're going to do is they're going to run a bunch of math and they're going to say, I'm going to offer you this amount of money that's less so that when I finally get my $11,000 on that contract, my effective interest rate will have been 5% because that's what these ones are. And I did some of that math and it works out to about $7,350, somewhere about there, right? So basically you buy a bond, you give the government $10,000 cash, the next day interest rates shoot up. And now that thing you bought is only worth 7350. That's basically how a bond bubble breaks. 
when existing bonds out there are floating around and stuff, right? And then the interest rate goes up on all the new bonds, all the existing bonds, there, there's still a contract. You're still going to get your money back at the end of that amount of time, right? You're still going to get that full $10,000 back and you're going to get that tiny little bit of interest. But if the new bonds are here, inflation also went up. And so you're going to lose money due to inflation and due to loss of gains elsewhere. And so that's the reality. That's how bonds basically break. You know, your principal investment becomes not worth very much. So there we go. That's how interest rates going up affects bonds. Now let's go to the last one. So someone in the comments of one of, uh, one of my video posted on Greg's thing said, what's the yield curve? So maybe I'll just describe what that basically is and then talk about it a little bit. Um, so I think it's percents you'll have on this axis. So like, you know, 1%. 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%. And then what you have here is like the different bonds. So all the way up here is going to be like the 30 year bond. And then what you have down here, um, let's just, let's keep the, uh, well, we can put the month ones on. So I think they're called the bills, right? So this is like down like the one month bill, then all the way up at like, you know, the 11 month bill. And then you eventually get into the one year, then like the 10 year and the 15 year. So anyways, the point is, the amount of yield that you'll get on your bond, um, the longer you give someone your money, um, the less opportunity to use your money you have, right? Giving that money away for a longer period of time is a harder thing. So if I'm going to let my some, someone use my money for longer, I'm ex going to expect more return on it. And so in a healthy market, what you have is something that kind of goes like this, right? where by the time you're all the way up to 30 year, you're making a pretty decent interest rate because you're giving that money up for an awful long time. So yes, you're making 5% a year, but there's a risk there. Like if, if you're making 5% a year, but we ever hit like 1980s inflation and the inflation rate goes way up, you're gonna lose money and you're gonna wish you hadn't done this, right? So this is a normal curve and it's going up basically, right? When Greg Manorino says the flattening of the yield curve, um, that could either mean these ones are coming up or these are going down, but what you're effectively getting is the yield curve looks like this. That almost all these years are paying like about the same amount of money. And what that indicates is it indicates that the whole market is off, right? You might remember in that last image that I showed that when the treasury puts bonds out there, they're going to sell them. The government wants to sell them as cheap as they can, right? So if people are willing to buy bonds at these lower rates, then that's what they're going to do, right? And so when the yield curve starts to flatten, um, historically, that has preceded some crashes. Like the dot-com crash was preceded by a flattening yield curve, and the 2008 crash was preceded by a flattening yield curve. So Gregory Manorino has been pointing out that the yield curve has been starting to flatten, and he's using that as an indicator that there could actually be a crash coming. So that's what that basically means. So there we go. Boop. All of them are done. So anyways, thanks everybody for uh, watching. If you watched this far, I hope this was entertaining. I hope it was informational. And uh, big thanks out, especially to you, Gregory Manorino. Um, you've been awesome. I really respect you, man, putting this information up. And you've helped me with stock trading. And you're helping the world with stock trading. And even if you don't post this on your channel, Dude, props to you. I'm very, very respectful of you. Anyways, thanks everybody. Have a good day.